Good afternoon, folks. This is Brandon Freed, Executive Director of the Air Forwarders Association. Thanks for joining us today. You know, the Air Forwarders Association believes that access to training, education, networking, data, and current information are the keys to enhancing our member success in what's become an extremely competitive and volatile and exciting marketplace. In addition to advocating for our members here in Washington, not only on Capitol Hill, but throughout regulatory agencies, including Customs and Border Protection, TSA, FMCSA, the whole alphabet, we believe that providing access to current news, information, and data is important to give you a competitive edge. And that's why we've teamed up with FreightWaves, a data and content forum that provides market participants like you with near time analytics on the state of the freight market and tools that provide actionable outcomes. In fact, FreightWaves is the leading go-to source for information about the freight markets and is cited in publications as original material, including the largest news sites in the world, Bloomberg, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Reuters, New York Times, CNBC, Forbes, Fortune, just to name a few. Now, we have, uh, you may have seen Marketplace Insights gained by FreightWaves published on its news site, FreightWaves.com, uh, which has been recently chosen as the number one logistics news site in the world by Alexa. And in addition to the current content found there, you can look forward to seeing in, uh, more information pertaining to the freight forwarding industry by going to airforwarders.org and clicking on the member resources link at the top of our homepage where you'll find a new microsite uh, providing access to this vital news and information. So FreightWaves also prepares geo heat maps and barometers that map the freight market, helping participants to understand how the market will impact them. And these market maps, indices, commentary, and analytics are now available for freight market participants, freight forwarding market participants, on its Sonar platform, which we are going to learn more about today. And you, as an Air Forwarders Association member, will have free access uh, for the next six months of, of the Sonar platform. So let me first introduce you to FreightWaves team members, including Will Sahistat, Reed Clements, and Jesse Cohen, who are going to be guiding us through this new partnership and its opportunities and our plans for the future in this partnership with FreightWaves. And I also want to remind you that FreightWaves will be attending the Air Cargo 2020 conference. If you haven't registered, do so as quick as you can by going to aircargoconference.com. Uh, and there they're going to be, uh, in addition to, to having their live TV radio soundstage, uh, Craig, CEO Craig Fuller of FreightWaves will be delivering the Tuesday morning keynote during which he's going to provide his unique insights into where the industry is headed and what you should know to stay ahead of the game. So I'm going to turn this over to the guys from FreightWaves so they can walk us through this partnership and where we're going from here and and how you as an Air Forwarders Association member are going to benefit. Will and, and Jesse and Reed, are you still with us? Hello, hello. Yeah, we are. You're ready. You are. Fantastic. Okay, so now we got the communication thing down. Will, why don't you kick us off here and, and let us know what's, what's going on and, and how Air Forwarders Association members are going to benefit from this partnership. Yeah, hey, this is Reed Clements over here on the FreightWaves team. Will is uh, joining us in the room, so I'll be taking over and sharing my screen from here. Uh, we're excited to, to get this partnership off the ground and talk about the relationship between FreightWaves and the Air Force Association. Um, to give some background and a bit more, um, I guess, industry knowledge on FreightWaves for those who are not as familiar, uh, what we do here at FreightWaves is, is, first and foremost, we are a uh, a website that started as a blog post a few years ago that has launched into, as Brandon said, um, the number one most traffic site for transportation, news, and analytics. It was primarily focused around uh, the domestic truckload market at the very start and has quickly grown into a global freight uh, transportation and news analytics platform um, over the past three years. 
Um, with that kind of growth and trajectory we've had on the media side of things, we've been able to launch a few different aspects of business here in, under the Freight Waves banner. Uh, one of them being our futures market that we launched earlier this year. And uh, another being our blockchain initiative. Those two have been pretty large and have kind of reached all, um, all aspects of uh, the global freight community so far. Um, one thing we're going to talk about today is a partnership uh, with Freight Waves and talk about our Sonar, which is our data aggregation platform, uh, which has been primarily used by domestic companies, but is now as we grow into more of a multimodal global freight tracking type of data aggregate platform, it's kind of growing into the freight forwarding community as well. Um, Jesse and I are going to be giving you guys some insights into the Sonar data, what it is, how it can be utilized, what different modes are in here, what it looks like, which is kind of what I'm doing today by playing around in the platform. Uh, myself, uh, Reed Clements, I will be talking more broad scale about what all is in Sonar and the scope of that. And then Jesse will take over to get more specific with the uh, kind of the air freight and air cargo side of the business that may be more specifically uh, what you guys are looking for uh, for your specific divisions. Uh, to give a even broader scope, Sonar looks at about 1,200 different data partnerships that we aggregate together. Uh, those partnerships are going to be focused around different uh, transportation management systems, different telematics providers, different ELD providers uh, on the side of kind of the domestic truckload side of things. But there's also government data sources we partner with, um, truck stops, uh, Drury World, uh, the Drury uh, indices, the Freitos indices. So we have a broad scope of partnerships that are kind of aggregated into Sonar. Um, we, like I said at the start, we start on the domestic truckload side. So we have a lot of data aggregated for domestic truckload. Uh, but as we've grown over the past six to 10 months specifically, we've grown into kind of an all modes of transportation, not just domestic truckload, but also uh, air and maritime as well. Uh, and like I said, not just domestic, but international. Uh, data aggregator. So what I just turned on is just a quick look at just shipping air and plane locations around the world. As I zoom in, you'll start to see specific planes and ships across the world. You can hover over them to see names of ships or names of planes and where they're going, how fast they're going, where they've been, where they're going next. Uh, I just get a feel for kind of freight commodity flows and specific locations of different ships and planes really. Um, so it's just an example of how we've grown into more of a global freight aggregate. Um, one thing I'll just focus on a bit more is just the domestic side of things and how the other aspects besides just the air freight side of the company can, can utilize our data. Uh, as I know, most forwarders tend to have a domestic side of things that have either a brokerage or their own assets being utilized to do those uh, once it hits the port where to go next sides of the movements. Uh, one thing that we uh, well, there's a few things that have been really powerful data sets that we are the only people that kind of have access to. Uh, one of those being where is freight coming from, where is it going to, and another one being the sentiment side of the industry, which is uh, being measured by tender uh, acceptance and rejection percentages. Um, before I dive into all that, I do think it's important to realize the scope of data that we have. Um, we, we currently track a little over $250 billion with the freight spend annually for the domestic truckload side of the business. Um, within that $250 billion of freight spend that we're tracking, we're, we're able to see what's being electronically tendered throughout the United States. Um, that's for those partnerships with different telematics and TMS systems is going to be pretty important to remember um, because that's how we're collecting data on an anonymously aggregated level to see those freight flows. Um, it's important to see where freight's originating from and where it's going because we're in a capitalist market here in America. So supply and demand is going to be dictating price uh, and the most bare bones necessity level of what we're looking at. Um, so at, to get started, I wanted to look at our head haul map uh, just to get a feel for uh, where pricing power is based off of supply and demand outlier markets. The head haul map is made up of uh, outbound volume minus inbound volume. And it's just going to be showing you outlier areas of where there's a surplus of freight available compared to trucks and where there's a surplus of trucks available compared to, uh, compared to the amount of freight being moved. And that's being uh, kind of promoted here by different colors. Blue meaning surplus of freight available, red meaning surplus of trucks available. 
Uh, I think it's important as a forwarder to be uh, kind of an industry vet and, and an industry expert with everyone we talk to. If, if you're talking to a client of yours and they think you're um, sending freight into Savannah and Savannah is a good market, you can come back and say, hey, you're right. Savannah is a great market right now. There's a lot more freight available than trucks in that market. Pricing power is in the hands of the shipper at that point, and as such, rates are going to be suppressed out of the Savannah market. Uh, but at the same time, it's going to be easier for you to go back to the carriers and, and say, hi, uh, there's a lot of freight in Savannah right now. Uh, if you want to utilize assets and keep the deadhead miles at a minimum, send your assets to blue markets. Whether it may not be the greatest rates in the world, uh, it's going to be a good rate, and there's plenty of freight available. Uh, and, and the red areas are going to be where um, shippers, have, or excuse me, yeah, shippers have more pricing power due to the fact that there's more assets than freight available. So you can kind of um, have the pricing power swing back to the shipper's hand. Uh, I think it's important to remember that data alone is, is data and it's almost useless, but data in the hands of someone who can aggregate the knowledge of what's happening is the most powerful thing in the world. If you know something that someone else doesn't know, then you can take advantage of that aspect. Um, but the, the point of our data is to, to provide transparency to all parties involved. Uh, we currently have our clientele base made up of carriers, brokerages, shippers, financial institutes, universities, uh, even insurance companies and real estate companies starting to use our data to get a feel for trends on the macro and micro level of the economy based around the transportation industry. Uh, and our goal is to provide transparency to all of those different subsects of the industry to uh, let everyone actually know what's going on in a highly volatile uh, industry that is transportation. Uh, we've been looking at a map kind of the whole time, but I do want to point out that a map is a small piece of the puzzle. Um, a lot of people tend to prefer to look at charts when they look at data, which is completely understandable. Um, so I did want to point out that we have different ways of visualize data, but even more so uh, the scope of data that we collect is, is pretty broad. Um, what we have now is DAT's van freight rates for long haul, and I have overlaid with that our tender rejection data. It's a highly correlated data set. It's going to give you trends and let you see where rates are going in real time, as opposed to uh, any kind of lag based off of reporting issues. Uh, but at the same time, it's going to let you see kind of the cyclicality of the freight industry as a whole, uh, kind of led by the domestic truckload side of things. Um, you can see every summer there's a spike, every winter there's a dip in, in spot rates. Uh, but you can also get a feel for the economy based off of this. Here's 2018 here. You can see how high rates were last year. I mean, you kind of look at that compared to other years past. It, it really paints a pretty picture for what everyone felt last year but didn't quite see uh, within the data. One thing I want to point out here um, is Class 8 truck orders overlaid with uh, rates, and it paints a really pretty picture of the supply side of supply and demand. As rates tend to go up and down, truck orders tend to go up and down at the same time, which is going to be a great indicator for uh, for what's going to be happening to the economy right now. So last year rates were at an all-time high, and as rates skyrocketed, every single company in the United States ordered more trucks. As those trucks enter the market, rates dipped back down again because there's a huge supply um, that entered the market, and it's caused a big depression in rates. and Everyone knows what happens when rates are down, trucks go out of business, companies go out of business, uh, Celadon being one of the latest, um, one of the latest uh, people to fill that. Uh, but there have been plenty that have already gone under this year and there will more than likely be a few more before this somewhat of a freight recession ends. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of different ways to track uh, macro trends in the economy using what some might consider alt data, uh, which we kind of have a plethora of with that. Um, we we kind of track all sorts of different trends within the economy. And just to give you a kind of a feel for the different data sets here, uh, all I did was click on the symbol list here under the chart to let you see the categories of data that we track. Um, obviously, we have plenty of air uh, cargo data, plenty of company financial data, different demographics data. Detention data is a big one I know Jesse's going to be hitting on later. Um, but there's a lot of data to be seen here around supply and demand in the industry, around macro uh, data sets such as the CAS indices. Uh, we have the ISM data sets, uh, job openings, warehouse data, uh, data around the intermodal sects, around the 
rail sector of the industry to kind of give you a multimodal look at what's happening within the industry. One thing we've been talking about for the bulk of it is the, the domestic truck load side of things. Uh, I think the rail and intermodal uh, subsection industry would also be extremely important to look at. Uh, one thing that I'm going to get to as I scroll through here is going to be um, loaded versus empty rail cars, where they're going, uh, what lanes are the most dense with uh, loaded 53-foot um, uh, containers and, and 45-foot containers and 40-foot containers and 20-foot containers. There are going to be indicators of where capacity and volume is going. If you can track the empty 53s, where they're going, that's going to give you a really good picture of where there's going to be the next uptick of volumes as it hits the United States. Um, at the same time, we do have intermodal rates uh, to kind of complement that kind of data as well. Still scrolling here, you can see the vast amount of data we collect and the different granularities within that as well. So if any of these different data sets or, or more uh, pertain specifically to your industry and, and what you kind of do, then we can talk offline about uh, how that could work for you and the ways to see value and ROI within the data and how to in turn interpret that data to, to get that value and ROI. So here we go, outbound versus inbound rail volumes for 20 foot, 40 foot, 45s, 48s, and 53 foot containers loaded in empty. Uh, what we mentioned was empty outbound rail containers on a market to market level. So you can see which markets have the most uh, outbound empties. So you'd expect Chicago to, to be a major market with that. And I just clicked on it to pull up how the 53 foot containers line up with um, with the rates for the domestic long haul rates. You can see they're not as correlated, but it's gonna paint a better picture for you when you kind of go back and see um, how do volumes for rails uh, coincide with rates for drive and truckloads. You can kind of get a feel for what's really happening here. Um, and it's important to denote that we're looking at just the market of Chicago versus the United States drive in rates. Uh, it paints a picture for what's going on in different markets and different areas um, here, especially around Thanksgiving. Uh, with this large spike of empties leaving Chicago. Um, we can take it a step further and do lane by lane analysis to see which markets are uh, these containers going from and where they're going to as well uh, to get a bit more granular. So that's what you can do with charts. There's a lot of different ways to slice and dice the data and, and analyze the data within charts. Uh, it's, it's even prettier when you make tree maps, in my opinion. You can see day over day or month over month change uh, for all of our different data sets, be it truckload, uh, air, maritime, rail volume data sets, uh, to kind of slice and dice the data the way you think would be visually appealing for you. And then even more important than that, in ways to uh, make it usable and digestible by your guys on the ground to implement that data. One thing we do very well with the domestic truckload side of things that we're going to be doing with kind of all modes is look at a volatility watch list to show, uh, in essence, which markets have uh, veered out of their standard range of normalcy uh, by a standard deviation of one to show what's happening for different data sets in these different markets. Uh, and as these different data sets get color coded, you can see a strong increase in volumes, which is almost every market's going through right now on the post Thanksgiving bounce back. Uh, even more so tender lead time being a big indicator for uh, when will freight be being moved? Um, is it going to be moved sooner rather than later? Should it be moved sooner rather than later? Uh, to give insights into, uh, like I said, this is primarily for domestic truckload, but into all modes of transportation as well. Back to the map here, just because it's the easiest and the simplest to utilize. Um, one of the new features we've added is points of interest. So you can turn on airport locations and seaport locations um, across the United States and the entire world, which would be important for the uh, Air Forwarders Association to kind of get a picture of. And what we have turned on here is just a uh, total number of exports in global ranking by size. So the larger the circle, the, the bigger the port, airport or seaport is. Uh, and you can get a feel for what's going on in those specific markets. Then as we go back to this, we can toggle on and off different sets of data to get a feel for it. And I believe uh, Jesse's going to be talking about specific data around that. 
so I won't steal any of his thunder, but uh, you can get a feel for what's actually happening in those industries and those markets on the map as well. Uh, and then um, we already talked about that, but kind of getting a bit more granular, um, using it as a kind of everything you need to know about the industry all in one house type of tool is pretty powerful. We do have uh, road traffic as well. So if a carrier is saying, hey, I'm, I know this is a super important shipment that's supposed to be there by Thursday afternoon, I'm stuck in the Houston market. Here's my ELD ping. You can pull it up and see, wow, he's actually stuck in that market. There's no shot he's going to be getting out of that anytime soon. Um, even cooler than that is you can turn that on and off, or uh, if, especially if you're in Atlanta, everyone knows how bad Atlanta traffic is. Um, you can go over here and go to the Atlanta market, see how bad traffic is, uh, turn on points of interest and turn the highway camera back on. And as you zoom in and out of different areas, you can update the camera search to see actual DOT camera live feeds of what uh, the roads are looking at within a 10 minute ping every time you click on it. So a lot of traffic going through I-75 in Atlanta, a lot of cars, looks like there's no major slowdowns there. Obviously it's just a picture as opposed to a live feed. Some cameras, uh, especially around the Northeast, are live feed videos. So you can actually see traffic in real time. Uh, but you can get a feel for what's actually happening on the ground and just have a tool to uh, be the expert you need to be to your clients at all times on a, on a very, very granular scale as well. Uh, that's about all I have to show today. There's a lot more uh, data we have within Sonar. We have 160,000 data sets updated every single day. Uh, we have millions and millions of data points in our data repository currently. Um, and I'd love to talk soon about our predictive rates tool if anyone's interested in seeing uh, drive in truckload rates, especially as those shipments are going into the port of LA and need to be going to Dallas. Should be using rail or, or intermodal door to door, or should be using drive in rates over the next week, months, six months, full year out to see rates along those industries as well. Um, we can take that offline sometime. I'd love to get personal because this is a extremely smart and dynamic algorithm um, that's been put into this by our data science team here in house. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into it that's going to take more than the next 30 minutes that we have booked for this webinar. Uh, keeping that in mind, I'll pass it off to Jesse Cohen and let him uh, take over from here. So Jesse, if you'll turn your microphone on, I will turn mine off and we can keep it rolling. And thanks, Reed. And, and Jesse, uh, thanks for joining us today. Jesse, why don't you, yeah, before you off. get started, if possible, uh, Jesse, why don't you let us know, let the audience know your background. Here. I just Can you all hear us? Here we go. Can you see mine? Yeah. Okay, hopefully uh, everyone can see a tree map with the title Wait Time in Minutes on their Jesse, screen. Jesse, can you hear me? So uh, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is uh, Jesse Cohen. I'm the air cargo market expert here at Freightways. I've been with Freightways since the beginning of 2019. And um, my background, I've got uh, six years in the freight forwarding business and about 30 years in the um, air cargo business with three different airlines. I spent most of my career with United Airlines based in Chicago. Uh, that's where I currently reside. And I spent um, the, the remainder of that time with uh, two different foreign flag airlines with responsibility for the Americas. Uh, my experience at the airlines has largely been on the commercial side of the business um, versus the operational, but, uh, you know, but basically we all work very, very closely together with the operations, so I can uh, talk to a lot of the uh, issues on that side of the fence as well. So in terms of what we have available in Sonar on the air cargo side of things, uh, what we've been trying to do, one of my responsibilities is to try to um, add as many new data sources relate, relating to air cargo as possible. And we have added several over the past year since I joined and we have additional ones that we are working on adding um, some over the next few weeks, some over the next few months. So one of those uh, metrics that um, we've added um, goes back probably to the summer um, is a wait time detail, a truck wait time detail for airports, but we have it not only for airports, at Freightways we have it for seaports and we have it for 
about 16 other um, industry verticals, um, the various kinds of distribution centers, as uh, truck wait time is a key area where um, efficiencies can be lost and there's costs involved and driver issues, retention issues. And it's an area that I think FreightWaves has really put a lot of focus on. But specifically talking to what we have available um, at the airports, what we have is a tree map of the about 20 airports that we have uh, sufficiently weekly measurements of um, you know, truck weights. And what we've done at FreightWaves is geofence these airports. Uh, so essentially we are reading any electronic tr tracking devices, telematics devices, even cell phones in some cases on um, tractors or on trailers to get a very good representative sample of vehicle traffic and wait times in and out of airport cargo areas. It's not necessarily capturing every um, vehicle that goes into an airport, but it's capturing a large enough number that we feel comfortable uh, putting it out on display. And there are some airports that I'd like to see on here that are not on here at this point in time. And we are periodically checking uh, to make sure that, um, you know, they're not up there at our threshold in terms of numbers of weekly observations. But essentially uh, what we have here is a weekly metric minutes of wait time. Um, and sometimes we end up with some surprises as we have some smaller airports or we think would be smaller airports, non-gateway airports that have fairly large wait times up in the upper left. You know, we can see Sky Harbor International Airport, which is Phoenix at 97 minutes. You know, we see um, underneath that Washington Dulles Airport, uh, 96 minutes, Detroit at 91 minutes. And then down on the lower right, we have Rickenbacker <laughs> Airport and Orlando Airport, you know, basically 26 minutes and 33 minutes. So uh, what we have in is the ability to um, look at this, and this is essentially it's for last week. The date is updated on Mondays. Um, and the comparison, uh, in this case, is yearly, but we have the opportunity to shift that metric to a comparison over the prior week or two weeks back or a month ago or, again, a year ago. So it gives us uh, an ability to sort of uh, get a high-level snapshot of um, where we are seeing uh, wait times uh, going at various airports. And if you were to take uh, Los Angeles Airport, which is an airport that has historically uh, been one of the uh, areas where wait times have been a problem, and you click on that square or that rectangle, you'll come up with detail. On the right, we have the chart showing wait time in Los Angeles Airport. Uh, and we have the ability here in Sonar to go back various time periods. I think right now we're getting roughly about three months. We can go back six months. We can go back to year to date. We can go back a year. Uh, I don't believe we have the data back five years, but in some of the cases we do. Um, and uh, I think that actually this data goes back to about February of 2018. But you can get a sense for, you know, what's the trend been in Los Angeles and uh, here, you know, earlier in 2019, we had wait times roughly, you know, of fluctuating, say, 70 to 80 minutes. But starting, you know, late April, May, you know, it was up there between, you know, 90 to 110 minutes um, and has been bouncing around a little bit since the end of what I would call, you know, sort of the perishable peak season in the second and early third quarters. Um, it's come down a bit, but it's still fairly volatile. We've seen, you know, large observations and small observations. And uh, so this is something, you know, if Los Angeles is important to you, you can keep an eye on. Um, again, it is the entire uh, airport uh, grounds that we have uh, geofenced. We have we do not take any of the off airport areas um, and we do not have specific uh, facilities. You know, we don't have a specific uh, Swiss port facility or G, uh, WFS facility or Mercury facility in there. It's essentially it's a composite of all facilities at that airport. Uh, so yeah, the other they, thing that we have available, and I'm going to get rid of yeah, this they, uh, detail in Los Angeles, um, we have the ability to track multiple airports. Not you know we, we had that tree map that showed 20 airports, but here we have three different uh, airports. We have Los Angeles, um, we have New York, JFK, and we have Chicago. 
and uh, these are three airports that have uh, that are among several that uh, generate a lot of wait time complaints and you have the ability to compare them over time and see you know how Chicago has been a fairly consistent you know somewhere between 70 and 80 minutes for most of the year maybe a little bit lower than that earlier this year um, you see uh, JFK in the orange um, coming up uh, particularly uh, in the fourth quarter really uh, spiking up a bit and um, then you can see uh, Los Angeles as well so there's various ways to look at the data and to parse it and analyze it and um, you know obviously this can assist you know in planning um, you know your approach to the airports potentially pricing uh, for airports uh, you know where you're going to get into higher wait times you may want to factor that into uh, account uh, in how you price at that airport so now I'm going to move on to another area where we spent a lot of time this year, and that's really on um, capacity. And what we have done at uh, FreightWaves, which is not really available anywhere else um, in the industry that we've seen, is, um, is put together an ongoing metric on a weekly basis of cargo capacity in passenger wide body aircraft and freighter aircraft that's available um, out of an airport and into an airport on a global basis and capture that for passenger aircraft and freighter aircraft and show that separately. And then we also have the ability to look at that on a route basis and drill down to that level. So what I have on my screen right now is data that we have really going back to the beginning of 2018 uh, on outbound air cargo tons. We've picked JFK you know, Airport in New York that shows the trend uh, overall in blue and then broken down um, for uh, passenger capacity, which is OACTP. That's the, what we call the sonar ticker. Uh, that is the green line. And we have a purple line that is freighter capacity, and this is weekly metric tons. This is metric tons per week of capacity uh, on the OAG schedule that um, you know airlines file with the official airline guide. And what we have is the, um, the trend of that. You can see the uh, the bump up of summer capacity. The green line tends to surge up as uh, you get into increased. Uh, Midsummer flying, and then as it gets pulled down after Labor Day, the line comes down. And um, you know, each airport kind of has its own distinctive patterns overall. But if you're, you know, working, uh, you know, if you're serving an airport, it's it's a good idea to keep keep abreast of overall capacity changes. Uh, obviously, again, we can take this down to the root level, and I will. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of unique about this particular metric is we have the ability to take it out 12 weeks in the future. Um, so that is the, um, for the, uh, the total line, the blue line, that is the uh, white dotted section at the top that goes out 12 weeks. So you have a, a picture of what has been filed by um, airlines for the um, first part of next year. And then we have the same for the passenger capacity and the same for the freighter capacity. So the um, so again, you have that ability to look out 12 weeks into the future. Now I will take that down to a lane level, refresh the data, and here's a year, year's worth of uh, Chicago Frankfurt. First, the uh, freighter capacity from Chicago to Frankfurt, and that's in the blue line, um, and again showing a 12-week outlook. Um, in the uh, dash line uh, or the dotted line, I should say. And then the um, green line shows um, passenger uh, belly capacity uh, on that same route uh, over that period of time. So, you know, uh, you have the opportunity to look at it at an airport level. You have the opportunity to look at it at a, a route level. We also have um, the opportunity to look at it inbound on uh, a typically inbound capacity and outbound capacity are very, very closely related. Uh, but you can look at inbound into JFK, you can look at inbound passenger volumes into JFK and inbound 
freighter capacity into JFK um, and to get a uh, to get a fuller picture. And then uh, another way to look at this with the tree map functionality, you know, here what we have is um, outbound air cargo tons. This is again capacity uh, for freighter flights only. So you get a sense for the U.S. Um, where we have uh, scheduled freighters that are filed with the uh, official airline guide and the vast, vast majority of airlines do file those with the uh, OAG. Uh, you have a picture of the total tons per week on freighters and uh, we can also pull the same thing up for passenger flights and get a picture of uh, what each airport looks like, the kinds of airlines that are coming or the kinds of capacity that's coming in and going out of those airports. And again, you have the opportunity to change the time period. This is a yearly comparison. You can look at it monthly. You can look at it. Um, uh, really, this uh, you, you can look at it against two weeks back. So it gives you the, uh, the ability to do multiple looks at the data. So we have uh, several other slices that are available of capacity. Uh, there are some folks that like to look at this with a, a sort of a a ton kilometer metric, I won't necessarily go into that, simply tons per week times the miles of each leg being flown. I, I have personally found that to be less relevant for the freight forwarding industry. That's a little bit more relevant for transport providers. Uh, but uh, for the forwarders, I think, you know, tons per week is probably the most relevant metric. So um, again, this would be the kind of tool that I would look at um, if I was, um, you know, serving an airport and wanted to get a sense of is freighter capacity growing at an airport or shrinking at an airport, is passenger capacity growing at an airport or shrinking at an airport, where should I invest my resources, what airports are growing, what airports are shrinking if you're looking at multiple airports. Again, it's passenger wide body capacity and freighter capacity. Um, it's not necessarily, it's not including at this point narrow body capacity or regional jet capacity as those aircraft generate re relatively small amounts of capacity and it's a, sort of, more of a different type of capacity um, than uh, what you can put in a wide body as you know. So I'm going to go into um, a couple of other metrics that I like to look at that are pricing indices that um, I think are, are pretty good and I'm going to um, go back a bit and um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, the, the China market, the China to the U.S. market um, is a huge driver of uh, air cargo into the United States. And it also, uh, and of course, ocean cargo into the West Coast. Um, and that feed then also uh, drives out uh, domestic demand for trucking, drives out domestic demand for air freight and moves on other modes. So to me, the state of the China market, how healthy it is, how strong the peak season is, or how weak it is, is something that I keep um, tabs on. Uh, I also keep tabs on how strong the Germany to US market is. Germany is a very strong market out of Europe. It's the, it's the largest air cargo provider out of Europe, Frankfurt being huge hub. And um, when that market is strong, um, you know, there's a the air cargo industry is healthy. That market has been very weak of late. So essentially, uh, we have two metrics, or actually three, three sonar tickers here, two of which cover Hong Kong and Shanghai, one of which covers Frankfurt, all import metrics as there is more tonnage coming into the U.S. by air than leaving the U.S. by air. But these help uh, provide some context for how strong the overall air cargo industry is and what we might be able to expect domestically as well. So. Uh, the Hong Kong NOA, this is the TAC, the Transportation Air Cargo uh, Price Index. Um, we have here Shanghai uh, Airport to North America. That's actually the blue line that starts at the beginning of 2019. That's when we started getting data for that metric. Um, and then we have longer term going back, actually longer than this. Uh, I can probably put this back five years. Uh, in the green, we have Hong Kong to North America. And we can see the peak season pricing spikes at the end of 2015, the end of 2016, 2017, 2018. And then of course, most recently, 
we've seen this year is much uh, much flatter. There's been a, a much less of a peak season, which really says there's a lot less volume in the market. I think we're all seeing that. Uh, certainly, uh, air cargo is down year over year um, overall, but uh, we know that the China market is down with the trade wars and such. But this is a visual picture of uh, some of that weakness in traffic, both out of Hong Kong and out of uh, Shanghai. A little bit of uh, pricing movement, but not much. And to me, that says there's, you know, demand is definitely slacker. If, if it was there, it was there for a much shorter period of time. And we didn't see anything like what we saw in 2017 or 2018, or even 2016 for that matter. Uh, Those closer probably to 2016. Uh, we also have the, um, in the orange line, the Frankfurt to North America. And, um, you know, here we've seen, uh, and these rates happen to be uh, denominated in euros. That's, um, we also have it available in dollars, but just to keep the exchange rate issue out of it, uh, we have um, rates uh, at euro 56 a kilo. You can pretty much see that that's been, you know, about the lowest level in the past two years. Uh, we've seen automotive traffic out of Germany really fall off over the past five, four or five months uh, in a big way, or probably even longer than that. Um, and uh, we have a lot of rate weakness. Uh, so essentially, this, this essentially provides direction of the market. Um, it's intended to reflect both the use of contract rates and the use of spot rates, kind of a composite. Um, you know, it doesn't speak to any specific price level. Uh, it really says, here's how the market is moving, whether it's up or down or sideways. So then the last pricing index I'd like to go through um, is one of our newer ones. And I'm gonna really just probably go to the past year, maybe a little bit longer. We have our jewelry air freight rates index. Uh, so the, the index that we had up there previously, the TAC index uh, is, is, is an index that's updated weekly. It, it's, its beauty is essentially on Monday, by the time we come here in the US, come into the office in the US, it's updated for the prior week. So it's a good uh, recent observation. The jewelry index is a little bit more dated information and it's uh, more contract rates, uh, sort of average contract rates for one ton of general cargo. And, you know, again, we're looking at direction of the market. Is it moving uh, on a flat basis? Is it moving up or down? Um, and how are, you know, rates in Los Angeles versus JFK versus Chicago? So we have about 70 lanes uh, that Drury uh, provides. Um, again, the data is roughly about uh, one month old when we get it. Um, sort of consistent with some of the other information that's out there in the marketplace. Uh, the beauty with Drury is we have more lanes. We have more ability to separate between New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. There's three different points across the U.S. versus the TAC index, which is uh, North America-based. So, um, you know, again, uh, we have both uh, outbound indices to uh, Europe, and to Asia from the US, and we also have several inbound indices that um, are explorable in sonar. So the really the last thing I wanted to do in going up here to the symbol box, uh, there's a lot of different ways to search for data. Um, we have here, you can see uh, four indexes that tie to air. Uh, we're actually in the process of cleaning this up um, and resegregating our indices because they've grown so much. But under air capacity, there's a lot of different metrics, um, outbound air cargo tons, inbound air cargo tons, and you can start to drill down. And there's a lot of data in these. Sometimes they take a, a minute or two to, to, um, to get down because in, uh, we actually have 7,700 city pairs that are um, available to search capacity on. Um, probably, I don't think we realized how much we were when we when we first uh, dictated when we first identified the requirements how how many uh, lanes we would have. But we have 7,700 city pairs, uh, and you have the ability to drill down and then point to what you want and click on it, and um, you know then uh, the chart will will come up in sonar. So Jesse, can you hear me? It's Brandon. Yeah, I can hear you. All right, so give us an example of, of a, when you say national, I guess you mean domestic, U.S., is that correct? 
Yeah, so this is a map of um, yeah the, the U.S. as a whole. All right. This is a map of the U.S. as a whole. You know, it's very, very high level. And, um, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's an aggregation of everything that's out there uh, on a weekly basis. So can you do city pairs? Yep. So, so I had the uh, example of Chicago, Frankfurt before. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's do, let's do uh, Chicago, Dallas as an example. So I probably won't, I'm not aware of anybody flying wide bodies in that market. So it may not oh, come up. Okay. So you need a place, you need a, a, a segments where we have wide body yeah. flying. So, yeah, so right. what, yeah, so. So who's flying wide bodies now? Well, we could do like JFK Los Angeles. How's yeah, that? Yeah, let's try that. Let's see who's front of that. So I just, well, so OACT is, is the uh, outbound air cargo tons. And then yeah. you, you put in the city pairs, JFK Los Angeles, it comes up, click on it, voila. And, you know, you'll get a subset here of basically three months back and you'll get some time forward. Um, I typically like to look at it a little bit longer term, uh, either a year or further back. That, and you get a sense for wide body and freighter uh, tonnage capacity in the JFK to Los Angeles market. So are you doing anything with narrow bodies? At this point, no, we have the data. Um, we have, uh, we would probably look into future at doing something on a, uh, uh, on a different set of indices. We could probably do something narrow body wise. That might be something we, we could um, survey members of the organization to see what they would like to see on narrow bodies. As a former uh, capacity manager at a major U.S. airline that flew a lot of narrow bodies around, I, I found those airplanes difficult to forecast um, on a, you know, we could basically say, well, every 737-800 airplane takes two and a half tons, but I, there were plenty of markets where I think we struggled with that, and there were other markets where we did a lot better than that. Yeah. But if, if there's a if there's an interest in looking at either narrow body departures or narrow body, some metric for narrow body capacity, um, we could certainly look at that probably uh, on a different index. So, probably a team of our members could get together with with uh, you guys and come up with some of the metrics that they'd like to see, uh, and uh, we can kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, Jesse, you had your volume down earlier. I was trying to ask you a question or two. So uh, I'm going to jam them all in here, if you don't mind. Uh, going back, Reed earlier was showing um, trucking data. I'm assuming that's ELD data off of off of big trucks at the airports. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. And then you're you're measuring your waiting times based on the geofencing that you described, correct? Right. Okay. So we, uh, we basically draw a geofence around the airport. We make sure that we've got all of the airport cargo terminals, uh, all, all of the airline uh, air cargo terminals uh, at the airport uh, within that geofence, and then we measure it as a, a collective unit. Yep, okay. Um, so I, again, I wanted to, uh, highlight, um, you know, there's various ways to search in here, um, you know, with uh, air capacity. So that's really our capacity metrics we went through inbound and outbound at the airport level, passenger and freighter. Uh, we also have, uh, of course, the lane level detail. We have the price, uh, the two indices on pricing, the TAC index, uh, which is available uh, in dollars, in euros, and in local currency, as we, and we also have all of our jewelry air freight indices in here, so you can get a sense for what's in here. Uh, the specific lanes in jewelry, and we have uh, some data that I didn't go through because I think it's um, 
may not be as relevant for your members. So we, uh, some of this data is government data, but it's, um, it's US air carrier uh, revenue um, for freight and for mail going back many, many years. It's quarterly. Uh, it's essentially what they put in their quarterly earnings reports, but it's broken down further into um, entity, for example, Pacific flying, Latin flying, Atlantic flying, domestic flying. So you'll have Southwest Airlines in here, you'll have United, Delta, you'll have FedEx and UPS, you'll have, you know, uh, Amerijet and uh, other carriers that are purely freighter carriers. So if you're trying to look at those airlines and do any kind of research on those airlines or on, you know, markets, you know, how much do carriers generate in the Pacific versus the Atlantic, that data is there. And we also have some uh, Airlines for America data in here. Uh, we're in the process of uh, moving the, there's a few items here in this air category that will be migrated into air revenue and volume probably later this week. Um, but one of the things you can do, uh, you know, you, there's a lot of data in here. You're not sure where to start. You can uh, type in Los Angeles, you know, LAX, and you'll get a sense for all the various different metrics that have Los Angeles in it. And that gives you a much smaller subset of things to look at. Some of them are trucking metrics. Some of them may be, you know, diesel price metrics. But if you're interested in everything that's involving Los Angeles, type in LAX, type in JFK for New York, or type in Miami for Miami, and you'll get it. You'll see everything that we have that that touches on uh, Los Angeles, and it's an extensive list. Be mindful when you're doing this um, that we have the Port of Los Angeles. Long Beach and Los Angeles identified separately. We have Los Angeles Airport identified separately, and then we have the entire key metropolitan area of Los Angeles identified. So just be careful in using this, that you, if you rent the airport specifically for like wait times, that you are identifying the airport wait time metric. It's actually KLAX. Uh, the seaport is US LAX, and LAX itself is actually the key metropolitan area around Los Angeles. So hopefully okay. that helps a little, in guiding it a little bit. But, uh, you know, if members have some time, they can explore this for the cities that they care about and pull out the metrics that uh, they're interested in. Obviously, we're happy to take questions after this call or on this call and, uh, you know, try to provide as much, you know, get everybody up to speed as they can. We continue to add new data, I would say, you know, almost every week we're adding additional metrics into Sonar. Uh, not necessarily air metrics, but we're adding other metrics that sometimes may be very useful to AFA members. So um, each company, each AFA member, forwarder member or trucking member is going to have to decide for uh, themselves how to use this data best, what, what aspects of it they're going to need. So um, how can they get in contact with you guys on the Sonar team if, if they want to give you a call and talk about Sonar and talk about what they specifically need? How can that be done? Sure. Uh, you know, they can always contact us at customer success at FreightWaves.com is the easiest way to, to get into our pipeline. Uh, we will be providing uh, Air Force members with additional uh, venues to get in touch with us to let us know how we can keep improving the Sonar platform and what they'd like to see, uh, and just continue to build out our partnership with your organization, Brent. So right. So so this is Sonar's first venture into the freight forwarding market. Is that correct? I mean, you've mostly been on the trucking side, and I guess maritime as well. Exactly. Yeah, this is our, our initial foray into to air uh, and ocean data, and we're going to continue to try to grow into those modes to be useful. Uh, and we think this is the, one of the exciting aspects of this partnership for us is going to be in, in working with your members to identify the most critical information to their business plan. So the okay. other thing, um, Brendan, I meant to mention, um, we do have uh, three additional things that we are working on. We have a little bit of. Uh, the ambulance activity outside here. Give me a yeah, minute. that or the place is burning down, right? <laughs> no, we're on, uh, you know, we're in downtown Chattanooga and uh, we're on a main street, not too far from the fire station. So we get a little bit of that Got uh, ambulance activity, but um, coming attractions over the next two to four weeks, um, we, um, 
We look to bring in uh, more trade information in and out of the U.S. Um, by um, air and ocean, um, by port or airport and country. So it should give us the ability to look at trade trends from the U.S., well, let's say China to the U.S., Vietnam to the U.S., Taiwan to the U.S., or you know, China to Los Angeles, uh, Vietnam to Chicago, um, you know, Taiwan to Dallas, uh, and export-wise, you know, Dallas back to Taiwan, et, et cetera. So we have the ability to look at volumes and, and trade value going mm -hmm. in both directions. Ultimately, we want to bring in commodity level information. It's just that there's a lot of commodity level information and how do we do that efficiently? Um, so that one is fairly far along with our data science team. Um, another metric that we're looking to bring in that is partly, that is also pretty far along, uh, we do have airport volumes in and out, um, both freighter and passenger, uh, going back many years. It's monthly data. It's a little bit lagged. Um, but uh, it may be useful for several, you know, for several kinds of different uses. Um, and we like to have as much data for people to choose from as we can. And we like to have as much airport level data as we, as we possibly can. Um, and the ability to look at what flew on a freighter versus what flew on a passenger, we think that has value. For, you know, obviously uh, freighters generate uh, the potential for a lot more uh, FTL business, full truckload business, flatbed business, whereas Passenger flights tend to be a little bit more, you know, more LTL, and obviously they can also generate FTL volumes and reefer van volumes. But um, we've got that coming in, and then longer term, uh, we want to uh, enhance our pricing indices and cover more markets. Um, you know, go beyond what we have with jury and try to get, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot more uh, markets so we'd be able to tell the direction of the market. Okay, that's kind of it for now. So, so here's here's my preliminary thought on this, and I want to tell our members on the phone that while Sonar is up and running, and and uh, we just were at the Freight Waves conference over in Chicago, we saw examples of it. There were, I think, you had close to fifteen hundred people there. I think, right. um, you know, so it, it's it's up and running. It's new to the freight forwarding side of the house, um, and so. Uh, the advantage is that Air Forwarders Association members have free access to Sonar now. So it's a work in progress that we as, in our, as a membership, as an association, can develop together with the Sonar team. And um, we can meet with you guys individually. Maybe we'll have a focus group or two or, and, and so that you can get to know the forwarders. I mean, Jesse, you come from an airline background, but you've been around forwarders a lot. Uh -huh. So as time goes on, I would imagine we'll be improving and we'll be implementing some some uh, tools that the folders are, are going to want to see. You know, most while, while we're the Air Folders Association, most of our members ship a lot of truck freight and, and ocean freight as well. So um, they're going to want to see or have uh, a usability on, on, on those mode segments. Uh, as well, so I think that's uh, it's interesting. And, and again, we have six months of access to this, folks. So let me uh, is is Will still on the line? Will are you here? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. So before we let these folks go, um, and I know time is of the essence. The, the, this partnership is is Sonar, but it's more than just Sonar with Freight Waves and the Air Forwarders Association. We're going to be uh, news and information, and, and do you want to take people through FreightWaves.com? Is that possible to do on this call? It is. Give me just one second to call that up, and I can take the reins. And I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to pull away from Reed and, and Jesse unless they're, they're finished, and then we can kind of look at some We're other done. Uh, okay. So yeah, I'm happy to turn so over. Everyone will bear with me for one second. I will. All right. So just to... Just to uh, 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 to re um, reemphasize what was said earlier, it's customer success at FreightWaves.com. Is that correct, uh, Will? That was if if one of our members wants to get in touch with you, correct? Yes, and we'll be uh, you know I'll reach out to everyone who has registered for this webinar. Additionally, so that my information. Unfortunately, my last name is 
a nightmare, so I won't push you through spelling it uh, during the webinar. We'll reach okay. out. We want to be good partners with your, your uh, association members because we think you guys are the leaders for the air cargo industry. Uh, everyone should be able to see uh, my screen now, which is an example of the, the web page. It was set up. It's a microsite under FreightWaves.com, and it is um, it's you know specifically curated news feed that's relevant to your businesses, not just for air cargo, but additionally for for trade information, uh, you know LTL and trucking as it's relevant, um, uh, parcel occasionally. And so we're going to keep improving this site. This will be a dedicated news feed that's specifically relevant to AFA members businesses. Right. Um, so so they can get access to the site either going direct or through the airforwarders.org site. You go into member resources, it's a drop down screen a drop down menu and you click freight waves, right? I think right. that's how we've done it. And you'll be on to the site. And and on occasion, uh, you'll be adding, as you just said, so if if you want us to uh, uh, to suggest more areas that uh, we'd like to see you cover, you can do that on the site as well. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. and this is a, a part, and it's in keeping with our uh, goal as a company to to be a leader not just in, in near and real time data that provides actionable insights to reporters, but also to provide that news in the context they need to understand what what is going on uh, with numbers in the marketplace. So we'll continue to, to reach out to Brandon, working through you, to work with the Air Forwards Association to create a really unique resource for everyone that's moving, you know, air freight as a part of their business and to, to appeal to the, the broader segment of folks for whom, you know, all these different modes of transportation come into serving their customers. Okay, so here's what we need from the Air Forwards Association members on the call. How can we make this better? It doesn't cost you guys anything at this point, so we need to know what you want to see on here in terms of areas that we're covering, how we can make sonar better, for, uh, uh, the uh, indices that you want to see, ideas that you might have for improvement, to, uh, because I know that freight forwarding is different from uh, property brokerage or truck brokerage. It's different from trucking. It's, uh, you know, we're our own unique animals, so we have a lot of freight folders in our members and our membership, so the more you can look at this and the more ideas you have, let us know, and we'll sit down with the Freight Waves team, and we'll get it implemented. Again, it's costing you all nothing for the time being, so um, I think it's important for us to, to make this as beneficial as possible to our membership. Absolutely. Good, good stuff. Okay. Well, um, uh, I, I don't know whether we were taking questions and answers on this. This is your your webinar today. Do you, do you do have a question and answer box of some type? Or? There was a question and answer for those who logged in using their computers and didn't call in. Uh, we did not receive any through the Q&A box. But it, you know, as we reach out to folks who registered for the webinar and reach out to the AFA membership, I think it's going to be, a, you know, we're, we're open to suggestions on how to continue being a better partner and how to serve your industry and create a really unique resource. Okay, so and I also want to emphasize that Freight Waves is going to be at the Air Forwarders Association uh, annual conference, Air Cargo 2020. That's with the Air and Expedited Motor Carriers and Airports Council of International North America. You're going to have your stage set up there. You're going to be doing podcasts and radio. And in addition to that, you're going to have a pretty big presence within our exhibit hall. So we're happy to see you there. And um, uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, interacting with you guys, and uh, we're looking forward to some great things from this partnership. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I know timing is of the essence for our, for our folks on the phone. Uh, uh, Will and, and Reed and Jesse, thank you so much for your time this afternoon, and we'll look forward to, uh, to a successful partnership together. Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. We appreciate thanks, Brandon. the chance to talk to you guys. Yeah, thanks very, thanks very much, Brandon. Look forward Bye -bye. to working with the, with the team there. Same here, Jesse. Take care. Take care.